halfway through a series that we've decided to do at the beginning of this year where we're going to be going through the core values of Salem Baptist Church. Uh, Pastor Dwayne started us off with biblical teaching. And then last week, Pastor Nate shared with us uh, sincere worship. Today, I want to talk about something, intentional evangelism. Now, let me go ahead and say at the outset, um, when we started dividing these up, I was, uh, I was hoping for biblical teaching because that's kind of what I do for a living. I'm a Bible teacher. And so they started dividing it up and they said, okay, Dwayne, biblical teaching. I'm going, oh, okay, as long as you don't give me sincere worship because I have no ability there whatsoever. I can worship sincerely. I have a voice. I just, I have a song. I just don't have a voice. And I apologize to everybody behind me. But I love the way Pastor Nate shared with how our worship isn't just what we sing. And it's not just in musical instruments. It's how we live our every day with the acknowledgement that God's glory is above our own. I was thinking that maybe I could handle genuine compassion, and then I was reminded there are days I don't like people. And so I thought, maybe not that one. And then I thought, authentic community, I can do that. But there are times I have to be reminded, and my wife reminds me of this a lot, that I could be hospitable, but I have a time-release hospitality. You're welcome to come over to my home, but at 7.30, you got to go. All right. Now, I'm not meaning to be ugly. I'm just saying that's when I start closing down. That's when I start falling asleep. If you've ever been at my home and um, I've tried to, rem never has been anyone in here. I'm talking about somebody else. So just know you, you can relax. But a friend of yours, all right? They've been in my home and I'll kind of start saying, yeah, all right. If I send the kids to go do their showers and you're still there, okay, well, that's signal number one. If my kids start showing up in their PJs walking around, all right, signal number two, you should have already... If I get in my PJs, why are you still there? The next step is me laying on the couch and putting my feet up on yours and saying, you better rub them because it's either that or mm, get out. And so, listen, I'm hospitality, but at that, that extent there. Um, I'm, I'm really sweet hospitality around 5 and 5.30. That's, that's basically my sweet zone. And so intentional evangelism, as I started thinking about this, this one is the toughest one, I think, for all of us. Because if I ask you the question, and I thought about doing it, but I'm, I'm going to dial it back a bit, that when was the last time you feel like you shared your faith with someone? Some of you might say, oh, it was just this morning on the way in, or it was just last week, or it was, it was yesterday, and that'd be great. But for the most of us in this room, let's, be, let's just all honest and be a family here. We'd have to start counting a little bit. And was it yes? No, was it yesterday? Can I count that one? I don't know. It, it may be a while back. And then if I ask the next question, what keeps us from sharing our faith? A couple number ones just go right to the top of the list. One of them might be fear. We're afraid of saying the wrong thing. We're afraid of saying something incorrectly. Uh, I've, I even heard one time, somebody told me one time that they were afraid that they would share the gospel incorrectly. And I said, listen, let me, let me help you breathe out for a minute. Never in the history of Christianity has someone ever started sharing the faith with someone and then led them to a cult? It's never happened. You've never, no one's ever come to, come to me and said, Pastor Rick, I'll share my faith with this guy. Everything was going well. And then he became a Muslim. I'm not sure what happened in that. No one's ever, it's never happened. Our, we have train wreck presentations of the Gospels. I was saved in the late 90s. And we had horrible presentations of the gospel in those times. Sometimes they were, let me ask this, has any of you ever heard of what's called a hell house? Thank you. Some people are like, I don't know if I should say that. I said it, you just raise your hand. A hell house was the Christian version of a haunted house where we took young people, teenage, usually the teens, because we couldn't get the older groups in there. They didn't want to go. The teens would go in, and we'd take them through basically, you just died, here's what hell is like, and at the end, there's this guy giving you a gospel presentation. Now, don't get me wrong, people got saved during that. I'm just going to say that that's not something we're going to do here at Salem. Just not going to put that in there. Because I'm not so sure that that's a great way. Did it lead them to Christ? Sure. I'm going to say that they were led to Christ in spite of that. I'm also going to throw out the $100 bill tract. Anybody ever seen one of those? Now, I get it. I get it. But I'm not so sure that's the best way. You're, you're in the middle of a place. There's a $100 bill. You pick it up. Whoa, nope, just Jesus. Oh, you got me, church people. You got me with that one. 
I, have people gotten saved from that? Sure. Just don't think that's the best way. I say again, they got saved in spite of that presentation. So let me say this with comfort. Sometimes, if not all the time, God saves people in spite of our bad presentation or even in spite of our, what we might feel, good presentation. So as I start thinking about this, I want to show this. This is our intentional evangelism um, slide. It's, it's on our uh, website. It's in our church documents. And here's our view on what is intentional evangelism. It says this, because we understand the church is God's plan A for reaching the lost with the gospel, we know our role is to be intentional in sharing the message of hope with those we interact with. Our lives should be marked with passion for sharing the love of Jesus, not only because it is our duty, but because we understand the love and grace we've been shown by God. Now, I want to focus on that first line. We understand the church is God's plan A for reaching the lost with the gospel. You see, God's design to proclaim his message of the reconciliation of the world to himself through Christ is the church. Ephesians 3.10 tells us so, so that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. Now, I would suspect that everyone in this room understands this truth. You're here this morning because you get that. We assemble today as men, women, and children who understand the gospel and its supreme importance. No one in here, I would say, is, is against that. We understand that the gospel takes us from objects of the wrath of God to children of God. We understand that we are taken from the domain of darkness and transferred into the kingdom of his beloved son, just like the text tells us. So that's not a problem for us. We get it. We should be sharing our faith. As a matter of fact, when I mentioned, when I, when I said, I thought about asking you who has shared their faith in here within the last few weeks, you kind of breathed out with a sigh of relief knowing that I wasn't going to ask you to raise your hand or force you to lie in front of the people that, in your pew. You were, you were happy with that. See, that's not a problem for us. We understand that we're supposed to be doing that. Here's our question. The focus of our attention today, however, is on that second part of that line. Our role is to be intentional in sharing the message of hope. So here's my question. What makes evangelism intentional? What makes it intentional? And even what does that word intentional mean? I, th I think it's neat. Every year Webster's Dictionary does a word of the year. You've seen that. I mean, they've, they've started it a long time ago and they do a word of the year every year. Usually this word is selected due to its use and or its perceived importance in the public sphere. Oftentimes the word of the year is already overused by the time it's selected and made into the dictionary so that we're kind of sick of hearing it when they make it a word. Now, the word intentional has never been, to my knowledge, a word of the year. However, it has become a buzzword in, in business circles. You know what I mean by a buzzword? People just say it all the time. They don't even realize how they're saying it. All right, uh, so here's a but, so example. Companies will seek to be intentional in their marketing. We want to target a certain audience and be intentional with who we're trying to reach. If we're a company that wants to be this cutting-edge technology company, we want to target technology people. Intelligent consumers are intentional in how or where they spend their money. If you've ever bought a car recently, or if you ever bought something that's going to cost a lot of money recently, you didn't just go and buy the first thing you found. You might have read some of the reviews. How many of you have ever read reviews on a product before you bought it? How many of you willingly ignored those reviews because you wanted the product? Thank you, a little bit more honest, that's good. But see, sometimes you have to kind of wade through the reviews if you're being intentional, right? If a person is a very big Apple fan, they, every Apple product they're all in, they're not going to give good reviews to the Samsung stuff or the Google stuff. They're going to bash it and vice versa. So that's the thing about being intentional. We want to be purposeful in that. Churches have started using this word intentional. We want to be intentional with this or with that. You see, intentional or intentionality has become the go-to term for any activity that we seek to be deliberate or purposeful in our decision and our action. 
We want to be intentional with how we spend our money. We want to be intentional with how we raise our kids. We want to be intentional with this or that because we believe it matters, right? We don't throw it away. Intentional is not a word we use for doing something flippantly. We just don't care. We're not casual with it. So when we say we're seeking to participate in intentional evangelism, we've got to take the time to explain exactly what that means and what we mean when we use it. So today, I'm going to give you three things, I believe, that make sharing your faith intentional. Number one, it's purposeful. It's purposeful. It's got a goal in mind when you do it, but it's also got a goal in mind as you do it. All right, so let me explain this. A couple things. Number one, when you're involved in intentional evangelism, we want to be careful to take an interest in the person, not the project. Let me say that again. Take an interest in the person and not the project. So when we say we want to be evangelistic, our first thought is we want to share our faith. So we might go away and say, hey, we shared the faith. That was awesome. But if we ask, well, who did you share it with? Oh, I just, I can't remember his name off the top of my head. Well, I'm not saying that. It might just chalk up to lack of memory. Or it could be that it was more about the project than the person. Avoid coming at people in a way that communicates that you're trying to sell them something and are not interested if they don't buy it. You understand? My wife was recently at a, a dealership, and she went in, and boy, when she walked on the lot, she was everybody's favorite person, right? They couldn't help but give her stuff. Like, would you like a cup of coffee? Would you like this? We've got a lady back here who makes homemade pastries. Would you like that? And like, just happy to see you. And my wife is just going to tell you what I'm thinking. She comes in, she goes, let me just tell you what I'm in for. The guy sat down with, him at the ta- with her at the table, had everything out. She said, here's what I'm looking for. There's the mileage, here's the cost. The guy goes, okay. All right, okay. And then kind of scoots back from the table, almost like unclean. I don't, you know, because he had a plan. He wanted to sell her something. She had something in mind. He wasn't having it. Have you ever dealt with, have you ever been dealt like that with people? When you show no interest, they stop being kind, right? I wonder if somehow we do that with our presentations of the gospel. We start by showing genuine interest in people. But then when they look at us and say, and I've had it happen, I'm not interested in coming to faith in Christ. I'm not interested in Christianity. I'm happy where I am. Sometimes we might go, oh, okay, well, have a good day. So our interest in the person has now been cut off because they're no longer interested in our Jesus. So take time. Avoid it coming at people in a way that communicates trying to sell them something. You want to earn their trust in more than one encounter. You can't earn trust with a one-time encounter. This is going to take time. It's going to take building a friendship with them. It's going to take going through deep things with them. It's going to take time meeting with them, maybe having a cup of coffee with them, spending time with them, getting to know them. Be prepared to invest time in that person. Be prepared for that. It's going to get messy. The more he or she gets to know you, the more he or she can see your character, that you live what you believe, and the more likely he or she will listen to the truth when you present it. How many of you came to faith in Christ the first time you heard the gospel? That's what I thought. Look around. I don't see a hand. How many of you, the first time you heard the gospel, you didn't want the gospel? I'm a guy who I knew the gospel. I knew it. I was the guy who went to Christian school, and I was the Bible quiz champ. I was all that. Still lost. And I knew enough about who Jesus was to know that if I put my faith in Jesus, I'd have to quit doing the things I was doing, and I loved doing the things I was doing. I knew that Jesus was going to wreck that. So I held it off, and I put it off, and I didn't see a need. But because people prayed, and people showed interest in me, and because one or two people loved me in spite of me, I came to faith in Christ because I saw it lived out in them. I saw their love for me, and I saw the love of Christ lived out in their love for me. There's how it works. You see, they want to get to know you. Number two, be yourself. Be yourself. You're like, well, uh, Rick, you don't know me. Yeah, I know you. Still be yourself. All right? Maybe be the better version of yourself. Maybe if you're a jerk, kind of soften that up a bit. 
But here's what I mean by that. Your openness and integrity is going to go a long way in moving this person from seeing your evangelistic efforts as just another sales pitch. As you get to know this person, you will likely find some aspects of his or her life that you can relate to, maybe their family background, maybe their interests, maybe certain questions about life. By the way, don't force these. Don't force these. You know, to do so will come off like a, you're condescending or you're trying too hard. Just let it happen. Be honest with your struggle too. Some of my favorite conversations with people who don't know the Lord, they're like, yeah, I just don't know if I believe in all this stuff. And I'm like, you know what? Some days I don't either. <gasps> what? Like, yeah, I got to admit, some days it's tough. And I'll, I'll give them one. They, they're they're kind of over here going, well, I think sometimes it's tough. I'm like, I'll go one. Proverbs says that if I train up a child in the way he should go, when he's old, he won't depart from it. But I see parents who are great parents, and their kids are idiots. And I see kids who are great kids, and their parents are idiots. And that doesn't make sense. And the guy's like, wow, that's a little too much. <laughs> But I'm thinking, no, listen, we've got to get some reality here. I feel like sometimes I'm in Ecclesiastes where, what's the point? Sometimes I feel like the psalmist. One psalm, Lord, slay my enemies. May their horses, when the blood rise to my horse's bridle. And then the next moment I'm at the end of that psalm, but Lord, I'll trust in you. There are days where I go from one to another. And, and what's fun about that and what's, what's great about that is that people can see when you do this they can see that, hey, this Christianity they've been sold somewhere else that you've always got to be smiling and never experience pain doesn't exist and it's fake. Guys, it's a myth that your faith is always smiling. You can struggle and you should. This Christian life is hard, isn't it? And if you're like, well, I've never experienced any kind of trouble or turmoil, we need to talk after service about what it is you're doing. Because the Christian life is difficult. And they need to see that. Number three, listen more than talk. Have you ever talked to somebody and they talk more? Or you're trying to, or they, maybe they talk the whole time. And you're like, man, we had a great conversation. And they say, what a great conversation. It was good talking to you. And you're like, yeah, I don't think you know what my voice sounds like. You ever talk to somebody like that? Maybe they start with the, oh, that's, you say something and then they go, oh, that's nothing. And then they share something about them. You're like, oh, all right. Listen more to talk. Ask questions. Now, you're not trying to investigate them. Don't come off creepy with this. But ask them questions and show a genuine interest in them. And listen to hear some things. You ready? Listen to hear their worldview. How do they see the world? Now, you don't have to ask them that. Don't, I wouldn't ask, what is your worldview? Because they're not going to know what you're talking about. Most people don't think about it. But if you spend time talking to someone, they're eventually going to go, they're going to unveil that. You hear their dreams their desires. You'll hear their religious beliefs. And here's the last one. Be careful to avoid a plug-and-play mindset. You understand what I mean by plug-and-play hardware? You've had a computer, you maybe had a printer or something that says it's plug-and-play. You plug it into your computer and it already has all the drives needed to, to run properly. You don't have to download something uh, off the internet to get it work properly. Just, it works. It's just, you just kind of plug it in. I also thought about using the phrase the, the recipe model, all right? Um, a plug-and-play model of evangelism follows a prescribed script or format. Now, listen, it's not necessarily bad. As a matter of fact, we've had some of those sessions here where we've taught this. However, I just kind of feel like they come off fake. So while they may help you with anxiety regarding sharing your faith, the danger in this model is it can come off fake or maybe not account for genuine barriers to the gospel. So for example, if I've got my, my binder out and I'm asking a question, I'm like, do you have any religious beliefs? And if they say no, okay, if no, turn to page seven, right? And, and that might help me get over my fear of saying the wrong thing, but I'm going to suggest a more organic approach. This quote here is from J. Max Stiles' book, Evangelism. Here's what he says. In a culture of evangelism, if that's what we want to develop here, people who love Jesus work together as instruments in the grand symphony of God's work. Here's the line. I love it. We don't always know what the next piece will be. The Holy Spirit orchestrates that. But if we're focused on Him and in His direction, we get to be a part of His, uh, of His work in people's lives. Guys, evangelism, organically done, you don't know what's going to happen next. And I think that's okay. 
Because what we're doing here is allowing the Holy Spirit to operate in this situation. Building on this idea, intentional evangelism is also patient. So it's purposeful and it's patient. J.I. Packer's book, Evangelism and the Sovereignty of God, which I think is a great book on evangelism, says this, while we must always remember that it's our responsibility to proclaim salvation, it's our job to do that, we must never forget that it's God's, it's the God who saves. We share the faith, but God saves people. Our evangelistic work is the instrument that he uses for this purpose, but the power that saves is not in the instrument. It's in the hand of the one who, is, who uses the instrument. Again, like I said, I think in the late 90s, there's Hell House and there's some of those tricking tracks. They give the gospel, but it wasn't them that saved. It was the power of God saving. We agree that that's true. We believe that. There's no sales pitch you could sell. As a matter of fact, the natural skeptic in me, if somebody tells me this is a foolproof plan, every time you share this, somebody's going to come to faith in Christ, I doubt it. I doubt it already. Let's keep going. This is a quote from Daryl Johnson. I want you to see this. and This is one of, the, one of the thought tattoos I want you to have today. Are you ready? Here it is. Evangelism is joining a conversation the Holy Spirit is already having with another person. You're not starting this story. This story has already been started before you showed up. The Holy Spirit's already working in this person's heart somehow. You're now the next part. You're the next piece. You might be the seed planter. You might be the cultivator. You might be the waterer. You might be the harvester, but you're not the main idea in this. The Holy Spirit's already working in the person's heart, and you're just joining in. And finally, and this is where we're going to spend the rest of our time and into a text, intentional evangelism is compassionate. Intentional evangelism is compassionate. This last characteristic of intentional evangelism is the rest of this core value can be understood in this last part. You see, our lives should be marked, as it says in our core value, our lives should be marked with a passion for sharing the love of Jesus, not only because it's our duty, but because we understand the love and grace we've been shown by God. If you've got your Bibles, I want you to go to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 3 through 4. It's going to be on the screen, but I'm going to read through verse 6, 2 Corinthians 4, three through six. This is where we're going to spend the rest of our time on this passage. This is where I would get my intentional driven evangelism uh, marching orders from. All right, second Corinthians chapter four verses three through six. Here's what the text says. And even if our gospel is veiled or hidden, it is veiled to those who are perishing. Who are the who are perishing in that passage? It's people who don't know the Lord yet unbelievers, the unsaved. If our gospel is veiled, it's veiled to the unsaved. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers. Who is that? Who is the God of this world blinding their minds? Satan, the enemy. The enemy has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Verse 5, For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness. Now, do we have a place in the Bible where God said that, those words? Creation. He said, let there be light. The same God who spoke into the darkness in creation and said, let there be light, says here, look at it, the God, verse 6, for God who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts, now we're talking about believers, to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So, I've got a question for you, I've actually got two. First question, in this passage, why are unbelievers unbelievers? Because the enemy has blinded their minds. Okay, why are believers believers? Because God has sh- Open our eyes to understand and believe the gospel. Notice who didn't do anything in that. I didn't do anything to earn salvation, and that unbeliever is lost because the God of this world is blind their minds to keep them from coming to the knowledge of the gospel. So, how do we play this out? Here it is. Understanding this passage helps me to see that the real enemy 
is not the person who disagrees with me over who Jesus is. The real person, my real enemy, is the God of this age who is holding that person hostage. You understand? When I read this passage, I picture those crime movies, those crime scenes, where like you have like this hostage being taken. You've got, the, you've got the guy with the gun to the hostage's head. Maybe they've just robbed a bank and they're coming out. And you've got snipers up on the roofs. And you always see, like, they always show the picture, the camera through the lens with the, with the crosshairs right on the guy. And the guy says, I have a shot, right? And then the, the guy take the shot. Because who are they shooting at? Are they shooting at the hostage? No, they're shooting at the hostage taker. Our enemy is the hostage taker, not the hostage. So when I meet a person who does not know Christ, my argument is not with them. It's with the ideology, the, va- the thing that the God of this age has blinded their minds with. And my job then is to now interact with that and help them to understand the gospel, to be a reflective mirror, lens, what have you, of the light of the gospel in their hearts. You see, guys, we are dealing with a real enemy, and it's not the person it's the enemy behind them. Have you ever thought about seeing that person who does not know Christ yet, whether in your neighborhood, whether the person you drove by, maybe on the way to church this morning, you stopped and got a cup of coffee, and they handed you their coffee, and they hand you the same cup of coffee every day to the point where you know their name and they know you. But have you ever thought about seeing them as in captivity? Hostages. They don't They don't know. And that's our job. Our job is to help free them from this. Now, I want to throw this out there before we go in a little further. What then after that? Because sometimes we might share the gospel with somebody and just kind of leave them out there. This is where we call discipleship comes in. And this is my definition of discipleship. Discipleship is the intentional shepherding or training of a new slash young believer to afford the Holy Spirit opportunities to stimulate Christ-likeness through his word. We see this in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 through 13. And here is on the screen, and this is the New Living Translation to kind of help you understand a little bit. It says, now these are the gifts that God, Christ gave to the church, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers. Their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work and to build up the church, the body of Christ. This, building up, will continue until we all come to such a unity in our faith and knowledge of God's Son, that we will be mature in the Lord, measuring up to the full, complete standard of Christ. Another part of intentional evangelism is that it never stops even after that person comes to faith in Christ. Otherwise, we're just kind of leaving people out on their own. We're teaching people how to swim by throwing them in the water. Which, you're like, my dad taught me that. That could have gone bad for dad. He could have either killed you or been a successful father that day. All right? But intentional evangelism involves the discipling of other believers. Those of you who've had little children in the home, maybe had a place in your house, a little place in the doorway that you kind of measure them. Maybe if you have more than one, one kid, this becomes a thing where like you're, you have the older kid, but then your second kid is standing where the first kid was. It's like, oh, at his age, I was already taller than him. Or they want to be taller, so they kind of stand up, right? And they're trying to measure up. Maybe if you have really fun, you put dad up there. Okay, So in my family, we've come through lately, it's it's not a crisis, it's just a crisis for me, that it feels like just yesterday I held my firstborn son in my arms and now he's right here eye to eye with me. I don't like that. I don't like it. I think I can still take him, but I don't like, I remember little baby Eli. I I thought about bringing a picture, but he's in here and I don't want to embarrass him. That'll, That'll come at your wedding, buddy. I'll bring it then. Now, he's... He's right there. And, and listen, I, I, I joke and say, oh, man, I don't want him to get older. No, I, I want him to. I hope he gets taller. I, I be, hope he goes beyond that. I hope someday that I'm able to look. I mean, chances are I'll start going this way. He starts going this way. And I'll be able to look up at my son, right? Okay, I'm okay with that. I'm okay that he does that. Listen, we, we're okay with that in parenting. We should want the same thing in our discipleship of young believers. We want them to go beyond us. We want them to go further on than we've gone down. Like slingshotting them in further than we could go. 
And that's what it means to disciple. Intentional evangelism involves this, the setting down one-on-one regular time where I'm going to share this, I'm going to pour my life into you. So what is it that makes evangelism intentional? Number one, it's marked by purpose, patience, and compassion. It sees lost men, women, and children not as projects, but as people who are in desperate need of a rescue. In his book, The Weight of Glory, and I use this guy, I use this quote a lot by C.S. Lewis. C.S. Lewis discusses the situation we all find ourselves in. I'm going to read the quote, but there's one line that's going to stick up here in a minute. He says this, It's a serious thing to live in a society of possible gods and goddesses. Now, he's going to talk about that here in a second. It's a serious thing to live in a society to remember that the dullest and most uninteresting person you may talk to may one day be a creature which, if you saw it now, you would be strongly tempted to worship, or else a horror and a corruption such as you now meet, if at all, only in a nightmare. And here's the, here's the takeaway line. All day long, in some degree, we are in some degree helping each other to one or other of these destinations. Now, the quote doesn't end there. Let me continue. It is in the light of these overwhelming possibilities. It is with the awe and circumspection proper to them that we should conduct all our dealings with one another, all friendships, all loves, all play, all politics. There are no ordinary people. You have never talked to a mere mortal. Nations, cultures, arts, civilizations, these are mortal, and their life is, our, is to ours as the life of a gnat. But it is immortals, immortals, whom we joke with, work with, marry, snub, and exploit. Immortal horrors or everlasting splendors. Ladies and gentlemen, whoever you meet today, from the lady who gets you your coffee, the man who gets you your breakfast, whoever, to the guy who cut you off on the way here and you didn't cut them back because you had a Salem sticker on. Whoever you interact with is a being who someday in the future will either be so beautiful that we'll be tempted to worship or so hideous that it would haunt our nightmares. But you, I want to go back and keep that line up. All day long we are in some way helping each other to one another these de- destinations. So here's my challenge to you about intentional evangelism. Who has God placed in your life who desperately needs to hear of this rescue? After every door, we have this sticker that was put up before I came. You are now entering the mission field. Today, walk with your eyes up and take those words seriously. Because we live in a world of immortal beings. And we can do something today that can affect their eternal destiny, both good or bad. It may be that we, we're just jerks and they say, you know what, if that's what Christianity is, I don't want it. May God forgive us. But it may be through intentionally loving that person as a person, not a project, and through being yourself and having ta- taking time with these people, it may be that you affect their eternal destiny in the other way. Again, it may not be you're reaping that harvest. It may just be planting the seed or watering the ground, but you are affecting this world in one way or the other. Will you pray with me today? Our Father, our great God, we thank you for your word. And Father, this is not a, a, a message or a sermon that, that really encourages us in any way. Lord, the text is meant to step on our feet. It's, it's meant to motivate us to get out of apathy. It's meant to motivate us to get out of the, it, doesn't, it needs to be somebody else, not me, mentality. And Father, I pray that that would happen. I pray that your Holy Spirit would take your text today here in 2 Corinthians. 
we would see people as who they are. Immortal beings made in your image who have an eternal destiny. And all of that hinges on their understanding, their belief in the gospel that Jesus is who he says he is and that he did what the Bible says he did. And Father, we in this room believe it. Father, forgive us where we have become brats about it. Where we have it, we want it, and we really don't care if anybody else has it. Father, forgive us. And if that's us, break every heart that thinks that way today. Don't let us leave here the same. But God, let it change our eyes so that when we go out today, we see people as immortal beings and not extras in the life of our movie. But God, may we be bold in our love and our proclamation because their eternity hangs on it. We pray this all in your, Lord, your son's great name. Amen. I love you guys.